world today where there's maybe not a lack of money or technology, but a lack of imagination, how we want the future world to look like. And we've heard all the other speakers. I think it's very, very interesting. If we can't imagine it, we won't get there. <laughs> we first have to construct it in our brain, think about it, try it out, prototype, in order to get there. Um, our brain first has to imagine it. So I want to thank you on a little tour to sort of feel how that future can look like, how it can feel like, how we can experience. And most of all, how do we get there? Well, how I got there is very simple. I put some people in a smart room 10 years ago with a pizza hole line and a deadline, and we got to work. So this is the studio in Rotterdam, in the Netherlands, a team of designers, engineers, project managers, an old glass factory that we renovated, where we make these landscapes of the future, prototyping, learning, failing, and as the son of a math teacher, I mean, I love science, I love technology. I think that's just a great tool to make those ideas come true. But what I really think what drives me personally is not so much about beautifying or decorating and using design to sort of glamorize the existing world. It's about reforming. So World Economic Forum and the think tank in Geneva, uh, which organizes Davos, and I'm part of that as a young, young global leader, did a research what are the top 10 skills you and I need to become successful? So this is 2020, I'm giving you the shortcut here. <laughs> so look at this, number three, creativity. Number two, critical thinking. Number one, problem solving, complex problem solving. All the things a robot or a computer are really bad at. Yes. And so this is very interesting. As technology is taking over, taxi driver, our garbage collection, our accountancy, our energy bill, does that mean that we will become robot folks? No, it means that our human skills, our desire to learn, our desire to create, our desire to share, why are we here today? <laughs> These are the human skills computers are really bad at. So I will believe that, that as we will live in this hyper-technological world, our creativity and our creative thinking is the true capital. And so the moment you invest in those skills, and you value those skills, you become future-proof. So you will go to Design Museum London, for example, not only because it's a great museum with a history and it's interesting, but it trains certain parts in your brain that separate you from the machines. Yes. Clean air, clean water, clean energy, clean space. These, for me, are the values um, that we have to embrace. Everything you design, either it's a car, a city, a jacket, food, Need to have those values, otherwise, forget it. So let's talk about clean water. I'm from Holland, from the Netherlands. And as you may know, we live below sea level. My Chinese friends, when they visit, they say, you are crazy. <laughs> Who lives below sea level? Just move to Germany, you know, go higher ground. But we don't. And more than a thousand years, We've developed a system of irrigation, of dikes, of water management to create our own home. So it's very interesting. Our whole landscape is designed and is managed in a way. Without it, we would literally drown. But sometimes, even the Dutch forget. And so the water council, and the, the, the who manages all the water management, came to me and asked, can you make something to create water awareness, rising sea level? the importance of climate change. And therefore we created what you see here, Waterlicht, a combination of lens and lenses which shows how high water level would be if we stop. We all are sort of know that the world is changing. And as Sir David also said in his lecture, we know the numbers and somehow but somehow the numbers they don't they don't help us change enough. So we started to visualize it and started to flood public spaces all around the world. Best wel spooky. <laughs> Spacey. Ja. 
wat ik, het gevoel dat ik erbij krijg is een beetje onder water. Dat je onder een, een, een laag zit. Ja, best wel mooi, vind ik. With the waves above us. And it's, it's magnificent. Ik weet natuurlijk dat we beneden zeeniveau zitten, maar ja, zoals je het zegt, zou dat uh, niet zo fijn zijn als ik dit opeens over me heen ga voelen. Nee. Thousand people showed up on one night in Amsterdam. And this is very interesting, you know, how do we create experiences where people are not just scared of the future, but are curious and come together. And, and you know, some people were a bit scared because they experienced floods in, in 1953 or the almost floods in 1995 in the Netherlands. They're like, Ugh. and they left. They didn't like it at all. But most people were more optimistic and were talking about that. Should we build floating cities? Or can we generate energy from the changing in tides? But most of all, the notion of wonder. I want to create places where people somehow feel connected to this new reality, to this world where we live in. And I think the power of design and the power of imagination is, is a great way to, to activate that. Clean air. Our cities, in a weird, 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 weird way, have become machines that are killing us. For me, there's no easier way of saying it. If you live downtown Dublin or London or here in Beijing next to a highway, it's the same as 17, 17 cigarettes per day if you pass a bee in hell. Without the pleasure of the nicotine. I mean, <laughs> that's a bad deal. When did we say yes to that? So I think we all have a right for clean air. Yes, we have a right. That should be our human right. But we also have a sort of role for clean air. It's not just waiting for government or policy long term, which is true, but at the same time we should act today. So I'm not a minister. I cannot say 20 billion euro in green energy today. This is outside my scope, you know, I cannot do that. I'm a designer, I'm an engineer, what can I do? And looking outside my window in Beijing five years ago, I remembered being, you know, like, what's this? Being remembering when I was this boy playing with a plastic balloon polishing it with my hands, it becomes... This is not rhetorical, by the way. <laughs> what happens when you polish a plastic balloon with your hand? It becomes... Static, thank you. It becomes static, electrified, and it starts to... Quick! starts to attract your hair. And I have always been amazed by that, you know? It's like a, a gift from planet Earth, from, from nature, it's science. What if we use that principle to literally build the largest smog vacuum cleaner in the world? which sucks up polluted air, cleans it, and releases it. So this is how these projects start. Unhindered by any kind of knowledge. <laughs> so you put some smart people in a room, you get the experts, and you say, well, I'm not sure what it is, but it has to be ready in four months. And that's what we did. So we built the first one in Rotterdam. It sucks up 30,000 cubic meter per hour, capturing the PM2.5, PM10, the nanoparticles, and running on solar energy, and therefore releasing clean air, so we have parks which are 20 to 70 percent more clean than the rest of the city. The city becomes a machine that kills us. Let's build machines that can help us, that can heal us. China started to call, how much, how much? And it became part of their war on smog. Long-term investment in green energy, electrical cars, more bicycles. But also, bottom-up solutions for today, local clean air parks. One tower is not the solution of the whole city. Of course not. But by creating a place where you can share the difference, where you can show the difference, is a way of top-down, bottom-up, meeting in the middle. This is in Krakow, in Poland, one of the most polluted cities in Europe. As this project was growing in Mexico, China, India, Holland, <laughs> this is a beautiful one in um, in Poland, beautiful snow. And this was very interesting because I arrived at the day of the opening, and on the left you see Nick, he's the project manager, and he was running the show. So he picks me up at the airport, and I'm like, okay, so what's, what's up? Eh? And said, yeah, it's all good. And we did the scientific research, press is coming tonight, and it's beautiful snow. And um, so we arrived on site, and I saw tens of those dogs hanging out around the tower, and they looked really happy. <laughs> And it was like this weird David Lynch movie I walked into, you know, like this secret meeting I wasn't invited for. So I'm like, what are these dogs doing here? 
And my project manager says, oh, I don't know, you know, I, I haven't noticed. I'm like, well, you know, we have three hours before opening. Let's find out. And so we did. It's very interesting how you have to keep on looking. You get these little presents, but you got to see them. And we realized after two or three hours, of course, dogs have a very high sense of smell. And they can smell, what is it, 20, 200 times better than us human beings. So they were suffering from the smog, like way more. And somehow, somewhere, they could smell the clean air from far, far away. And they would start to abandon their odor and hang out around the tower. And uh, you see, that one is really happy with the tail. This one tries to be happy. It's too small. Yeah. <laughs> so if animals can sense what is good for us, why can humans not? We learn. This is Beijing smog. This is the stuff from the polluted urban skies. We believe waste should not exist. Eh? Uh, William McDonough, cradle to cradle, 30 years ago. Hello. Eh? Waste for the one should be food for the other. Somehow we never learn. This book is in my brain. So I looked at this incredible, disgusting kiss of death put it under a microscope and realize 42% is carbon. Carbon under high pressure, you get diamonds. That's interesting. Inspired by that, we compressed it by hand for 30 minutes and started to make small free rings. So by sharing a ring, you donate a thousand cubic meters of clean air to the city where the tower is in. And this was very interesting because at that time, in this time, in this world, to pollute is still for free. <laughs> in a way, we're talking about carbon tax, it will come one day, but to pollute is still for free. So we had a budget problem. Everybody was interested. But what is the price of clean air? Nobody knows. So, as we put this on Kickstarter, crowdfunding campaign, people started to purchase this ring. And so the money that we made, the finance we made with the jury, helped to build more small free towns. And that is really powerful, you know, that somehow the waste was the activator, it was the enabler. But besides the money, because in a way, money is everywhere, it was community. A couple of weeks later, these photos were sent to us, Tuesday morning, 8 a.m., where he proposes to her with the small free ring, as a sign of beauty, as a sign of hope. And this is not actor, eh? New York Times validated this real wedding couple, and uh, I sometimes check with them, and I call them, they're still good. <laughs> because uh, she said yes uh, to him, not to me, but to him. I don't know who that lady is on the top, by the way. But <laughs> and this is really beautiful. So yes, we need science, we need money, we need technology. Of course, it needs to work. But only technology or only money will just make us lazy. We're not janitors. We're not just maintaining. There should also be the notion of love, of, of something that excites you, like a story, something that, you know, you come home and you're like, whoa, you know. And I think that's really important, the moment you connect those two worlds of science, technology, with poetry and storytelling, you create impact. <laughs> Green energy, this is the offside, this is my, my country. Left is the sea, right, Holland, Rotterdam, my own hometown. As I said before, we live below sea level. This is our Eiffel Tower. This is our Chinese wall. This is, uh, what, what's holy in Dublin? Guys, come on, what's holy in Dublin? What's the most iconic? Guinness, no, don't say Guinness. Okay, Guinness, fine. <laughs> uh, 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 cultural capital next year, Galway. That's your new yeah, that's your new icon, yeah. So, normally, we are not allowed to touch, but because of rising sea level, renovation, it was a need of renovation, and the Minister of Infrastructure came to me and said, Dan, this is not just a landscape machine. Can you help us to yeah, show the beauty of this icon? We looked at what was already there, history. Built, rock by rock, hand, hand made, you know. Crazy, beautiful. Sixty of these floodgates were standing there, which opened and closed the walls of water. If these fail, we die. Built by hand in 1932 by Dirk Rosenberg, the first architect who was invented or invited by Dutch government to think aesthetically about functional objects. And he was also the grandfather of Ram Kolas, the famous Dutch architect. We decided to renovate them, make them look like temples again. But also wanted to do something with light, with energy, poetry, all these great words. 
And then the municipality came in and said, that, that's all great, beautiful, but um, no maintenance. <laughs> We're like, what? Yeah, no maintenance. When you use a lot of technology, it's going to break down the salt, the rain, you have to shut down the road, forget it. So we had to sort of zoom out and rethink the way we were approaching the project. And on a windy Thursday evening, we were there. As we were walking on this very cold night, we realized, but of course, there's a red light present on this highway, which is the light of the cars. It's very good. That took us two years, no, two days to figure that one out. The light of the cars. That's interesting. Inspired by the wing of a butterfly, reflection, headlights, dragging our Minister of Infrastructure into the story, and daytime, nighttime. So no battery, no solar panel, purely the reflection of the headlights creates an energy neutral landscape. And this is permanent, you can visit it every night. charge at daytime and glow at night. Space junk, which is currently floating around our universe. So 
So somehow we're not satisfied ruling our planet Earth. We just sort of keep on continuing outside our Earth atmosphere. Apollo 8, Sputnik, pieces of satellites and missiles started to collide and create this layer of junk. Tiny particles, although very small, have an incredible high speed and therefore are like bombs when they hit existing satellites and become a threat for our day-to-day -day communication. In the future with 5G, no more banking, no more uh, internet, no more Instagram. <gasps> so we started to team up with ASA, launching the Space Waste Lab. Visualize, capture, and upside. For 20 years, really smart people have been working on this. But we live in a world where to pollute is for free, and cleaning up is not fun. How can we change that? So we started to track, to visualize where the space waste real time is above your head. And everybody sort of agrees that a net, and with a small cube satellite, 20 nets, like a spider web, to capture the space junk is the most realistic solution. Not proven yet, but the expert world from ESA and NASA says this is the most realistic. Then we had a big problem, like, okay, this is all great, but nobody wants to pay. <laughs> Cleaning up is not fun. Yeah? Like when you were a boy or girl, and your mom says, or your dad says, clean up your room. It's like, yeah, whatever, I'll have my ice cream, I'll watch my television, I'll have my little popcorn. Cleaning up is not fun. And I think this was really interesting, because I am not smart in the ASA at all, because they're like super smart. But what I can do is add a new perspective, a, a new dimension. So we said, okay, once you've captured it, maybe it's not a problem, but an ingredient. Can we use it to 3D print houses on the moon? Which NASA has already scheduled to do, but then you're just shipping very expensive stuff from Earth all the way up. Upcycle it. Or here, once in a controlled re-entry way, it hits the Earth atmosphere, what happens then? It burns. So that's interesting. Waste is light. Can we use that to create, from space waste, artificial shooting stars? as a replacement for fireworks. And it appears, yes we can. Dubai is spending 8.1 million euro per year on fireworks, and then like 17 million euro on fireworks. Traditional fireworks, very polluting, people lose their eye, etc. So what we're doing is saying, just take that budget and spend it on this, you clean up space, and you have a new way of fireworks. And they're almost saying yes, that's really interesting. To conclude, I talked about clean air, clean water, clean energy, clean space. And maybe, for some of you, this sounds like a utopia, what you mentioned in the Soviet time. Like this perfect world, a rainbow in the sky that we will never ever reach. <coughs> and I don't think that's true. And that's not the reason why I'm doing it. I believe in a protopia, prototype. A, a, a term coined by Kevin Kelly, the founder of the Wire magazine, where we prototype, where we learn, where we're going to make a mistake, where we're going to fail, where we're going to learn from that again, and we're going to upgrade and somehow find a way of making it happen. It's not about being right, but it's about realizing that we have to invest in new ideas to survive. We have to trigger that imagination of how we want that future world to look like. And that starts today, not tomorrow. All right, thank you. Yes.